Grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. This is what we celebrate throughout the Christmas season. It's the passage that we looked at on Christmas Eve, and then ever since then we've been looking at the ways that people responded to this child that was born, the son that was given. And we see in their patterns some patterns that we can learn from, many examples that are worthy of following, some that we most definitely do not wish to emulate. We first saw the response of the shepherds who heard and saw and then proclaimed what they had heard and seen and praised God for it. We saw the example of the people who heard hearing the shepherds' proclamation, marveled at what God has done. We saw Mary's response, which was repeated again in today's passage, if you noticed, that she treasured all these things in her heart and pondered them. And we certainly would do well to do the same. Last week, we saw Herod's response, which is the negative side, and yet one that we have to admit as humans we often fall into as well, which is to reject the King, the Lord, the Messiah. Herod did so even with violence, ordering the death of innocent young ones to try to defend what he thought was more important, his plans and his purposes which Jesus would threaten and would hinder. And we have the same tendency in our own lives that we must repent of and look to Christ's forgiveness as we do at the beginning of each service. Today, Jesus has grown a little bit. Our passage today tells us that he's 12 years old and we see another response, in fact, another pair of responses. But first, let me set the scene again a little bit. It's a familiar passage, but one that's worth inhabiting a bit rather than just reading past. There's a lot of details that are hidden in here that are helpful to draw out. So the setting is Jerusalem. Jesus, we're told, is 12 years old. Now that's significant because for observant Jews, 12 years old is when a young man becomes a bar mitzvah, a son of the instruction or a son of the law. It's the age by which they're supposed to be well enough trained in the languages to be able to read the Bible. They're supposed to memorize a portion of the Bible, and then for the first time in their lives, they're allowed to speak to the assembly the words that they've been learning. It's the first step in their adult journey in their life of faith, and Jesus is 12 years old. That's gonna be significant in just a few moments. He's 12 years old. The setting is not Nazareth, which is his hometown, but is instead Jerusalem. Because we're told that it was the habit of Mary and Joseph to take their family to Jerusalem to observe the Passover. There were three major feasts that observant Jews were supposed to make the trip to Jerusalem for. But if you couldn't afford to take time away from the farm or from the job three times a year, at the very least, the big celebration you were supposed to travel for, much like Christmas in our society, in their society, was Passover. If there was any way you could make it possible, you were to celebrate Passover in the temple at Jerusalem. And we're told it was their habit. This would be the twelfth time Jesus had done that in his life. Now when you did that in that society, traveling on the roads was a dangerous thing to do. Not just because the roads themselves could be dangerous, but because it was an easy place for criminals to watch for easy prey. And one time that they knew there would be a lot of prey, on the roads would be Passover. But their strength in numbers and the practice would have been for people from a village to travel in groups. Groups of family members and relatives and even neighbors and acquaintances. They would all travel together in a sort of a caravan. And the strength in numbers, they could watch out for one another. Which makes sense of what happened. Because they leave Jerusalem and they don't realize that Jesus is not with them. That stands to reason if you're traveling in a large group, people are going to kind of sort out by age, not just because of the speed that they travel, but because that's what humans do. We seek out other people at a similar stage of life frequently, especially when we're young. So Jesus, the 12-year-old, would be expected to be walking along with the other 12-year-old boys, and that's where his parents assumed that he was. He was with them when they started. They assume he still is as they travel on these busy and crazy roads in a large group. They don't realize that he's not with them until they break and set up camp for the first night. And then as they're setting up camp, 
Boy, when was the last time you saw Jesus? Anybody seen Jesus? You start asking around. Of course, they're all setting up camp, so it's kind of a crazy set. Well, I thought he was with us. Now, any parent can relate to the panic that would be growing, that sort of pit of the stomach fear. I don't know where my child is. And I can't think of the last time that I saw him. And I'm not sure who the last person was that saw him. And the whole reason we're traveling to this big group is because roads are dangerous. And as parents, you would start to run through the possible scenarios of where he might be and what his circumstances might be. But here's the problem. When do you stop walking and set up camp? When it's getting dark. When you need to spend the night. And it's growing darker and darker as they realize that he's not with them. Can they set out and search for him now? They have no choice but to spend what I can only imagine was a sleepless night, saying, first thing in the morning, we need to start heading back and see if we can find him. Now, I don't know why it had escaped me. I'd always thought you'd just make a beeline back for Jerusalem, right? But they don't know where he is or what's happened to him. So imagine that journey for them. You've got a flow of traffic heading north out of Jerusalem. All of the Passover pilgrims are trying to make their way this way, and Mary and Joseph are trying to go that way, asking every group that comes by, because maybe if he got slowed by something, he just joined in with another group. So you'd have to be asking everybody, have you seen my son? Have you seen Jesus? But those wouldn't be the only ways that they would be. It says they went back searching for him. Honestly, you'd be looking by the side of the road, everywhere there was a dip or a cliff or anything like that, fearing the worst. Can you see anything over there? Imagine what their day was like, and by the, by the time night falls again, they still haven't found him, which I have to imagine means another sleepless night. But at least now they've arrived in Jerusalem. Presumably you'd go first to wherever it was they had stayed. Maybe they'd stayed just a couple miles away where their relatives were in a familiar town called Bethlehem. But when he's not there, you start having to look through what was the largest city in their country, not big by our standards, but certainly big by theirs, and just walking around, seeing if you can find him. And of course, we know where they do find him. They find him in the temple. That sets the scene. I hope it helps you to inhabit the scene a little bit. When they find him in the temple, what's he doing? He's asking questions and sharing answers with the teachers of the law. And here we transition back into seeing how did people respond to Jesus when they encountered him. And the first response that we're going to take a look at today is in verse 47. It says, All who heard him were amazed, amazed at his understanding and at his answers. Now the Jews took pretty seriously God's instruction that they were supposed to always be in his word, always teaching it, always discussing it, always debating it. That's what the teachers and the scholars of the law would do, and where they did that was in the temple. The idea was that in the temple, God's law was always being read and marinated and meditated on and talked about. That at any given time, you go into the temple, you can join in a Bible study. It's going to be ongoing. People are coming and going, but the conversation keeps happening. And now here's this 12-year-old boy. And here's where the fact that he's 12, he's just old enough to just become a bar mitzvah, a son of the law himself. He's asking the questions. Now, this is the way Jewish teaching happens, with questions and with answers, with challenges and responses. We see that throughout the Gospels, throughout Jesus' life. He's asking questions, but it also says the people are amazed at his answers. So he's jumping right in the dialogue here about God's Word. And what's the response of all those who hear? That would include pilgrims in the temple, but it also would include the professional teachers of the law. What's the response? says that they're amazed. I love the Greek word that's used here for amazed. The, the noun form would be ecstasis. Sound familiar? Ecstasis? Ecstasy. It literally means to be beside yourself. They're beside themselves at what they're seeing this 12-year-old boy is able to do. Now that becomes particularly remarkable when you consider that these are the rabbis of their time. And one of the tasks of the rabbis was to spot the best and the brightest, and to make them their disciples. So these teachers of the law should be pretty familiar with seeing the best and the brightest. Young men with their questions and even with their answers, they've seen the very best that Israel has to offer, and somehow what Jesus is able to do amazes them. 
causes them to be beside themselves. One of the things that I take away from this, I think there's a lot we could discuss, but most prominent to me, doesn't matter how much you know, God can still amaze you. These were the best teachers available. They didn't have universities at, this, at that time. This was it. These were the doctors of the law, as we referred to them in the hymn that we just sang. They had the best credentials you could possibly have. And still, when they encountered God, they were knocked right out of themselves. They were beside themselves at what this 12-year-old was able to do. It doesn't matter how much learning you've got. God can still amaze you. I think it's interesting to note that it's the same group of people, some of them might be the exact same individuals, who would later become Jesus' most dogged enemies, the scribes and the teachers of the law, were those who would later feel most threatened by Jesus. Why is that? Well, we as humans, as we gain knowledge and understanding, we sometimes start to feel more and more threatened by different knowledge and different understanding. We start to think we've got this all figured out, and God, who cannot be fully figured out, becomes more and more of a threat to us in our security. We think we've got it all wired, we've got it all nailed, we understand all of it. And sometimes that makes us less and less able to see who God is and what he's really up to. When we can explain on a biochemical level why the sickness went away, we're less inclined to call it a miracle. And yet, whether God used doctors and medicine or a more direct intervention, every time that death is brought back to life, that sickness is brought to healing, we ought to thank God for it and acknowledge it as a miracle. But the more we gain knowledge, sometimes we lose wisdom. That's why Solomon's request was such a good one. He didn't ask for knowledge. He asked for wisdom. That's why the wisdom that we talked about in the psalm is such a wonderful blessing. Not just knowledge, but wisdom. Because it doesn't matter how much you know, God can still amaze you, cause you to be beside yourself, draw you outside of yourself, your own limited understanding, your own limited viewpoint, your own limited self, to see that he's much bigger. And I hope that this Christmas season, as I hope that at all times, we can be amazed by God and who he is and what he does. But it doesn't end there. We've still got Mary and Joseph to speak about. Now, I want to be totally fair to them. After on the, They're on the third day now, by the way. That's somewhat significant, biblically. On the third day ought to ring some bells in your mind. On the third day, that which was thought to be dead is now found to be alive. On the third day, that which we thought we understood is now revealed to be something greater than what we thought. God's a really good author, so I don't think it's by chance that in the story, the history that he wrote, this happens on the third day. But in sympathy to Mary and Joseph, it does mean they've probably gone something in the neighborhood of 72 hours with no real sleep at this point. So they're not at their best, let's be fair. But how do they respond? Before you answer, we're going to look at the text so you know how they responded, but before you answer, I want you to consider that of all the people there seeing what's happened, as far as we're aware, they're the only two people who have had angels tell them who Jesus is. They know that he's the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. They know that he's the son that's been born unto us, which is the savior, the Messiah, the Lord. This has been told to them. Mary's already been pondering this in her heart for 12 years at this point, to say nothing of the nine months of the miraculous virgin pregnancy. If anybody ought not to be surprised at what's happening, it's Mary and Joseph. In fact, Jesus responds, didn't you know that I would be in my father's house and about my father's business? He's not being callous or mean, he's just kind of surprised. You've had 12 years plus nine months to kind of come to terms with who I am, and yet what is their response? We see it in verse 48. When his parents saw them, saw him, they were astonished. Now, I told you the word for amazed, we can translate literally as being beside yourself. And I love that that's a phrase we still use in English. Astonished is even more powerful. They're mostly synonyms, even like in English. You know, if I say I was amazed by something or I was astonished by something, for the most part, that's going to mean the same thing. But there is a little bit different nuance. If I say I was amazed by how well you did, 
That means that you did as well as I could have possibly expected or, or maybe even better, right? But if I say I was astonished at how well you did, that implies I didn't think you could do it. Amazed is sort of a surprise in amount of degrees. Astonished is something you didn't see coming at all, right? If you're astonished, you're even more surprised than when you were amazed. So why is it that Mary and Joseph, who had nine months of a miraculous pregnancy, 12 years of fulfilled prophecy about who Jesus is, why is it that not only are they just amazed like everybody else beside themselves, but they're actually astonished? And the word that's used there can translate literally as being struck. The other places it's used, it's being hit by something. Something that you weren't prepared for. You didn't even see it coming. Why is that? Here I find something that's both challenging and encouraging. If what we learn from the amazement of the teachers and those in the temple is that no matter how much you know, God can still amaze you. What we learn from Mary and Joseph is no matter how long you've spent with Jesus, he can still astonish you. They knew who he was. They knew what he was promised to be. The fact that they're still astonished by this 12-year-old boy teaching in the temple proves that no matter how much we meditate on these things, no matter how much we ponder them in our hearts, no matter how much we rejoice on them, the good news is even bigger. It reminds me of when Paul says that God is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ever ask or imagine, because I can ask for a lot, and I can imagine even more. And it's not just that God can do more than I could ask for, it's not just that he could do more than I could imagine, he can do immeasurably more than I could ever ask or imagine. Some of you here have known Jesus, thanks be to God, having been baptized as infants, and infancy having been some time ago, some of you have known Jesus for decades now. He can still astonish you. For some of you, your relationship with Jesus, knowing that you are his, and he is your savior and your Lord, might be relatively new. There's more. He can still astonish you. And I find this wonderfully challenging and wonderfully encouraging. Encouraging because no matter what you think you've already known of Jesus, what you think you've already experienced of him, and how well you think you've understood him, he can still astonish you. He is still capable of immeasurably more than you've ever asked or even imagined. I find that very encouraging. There's a challenge in it too. I'm gonna speak for myself, and if it's true of you, then you can just maybe internally nod your head. You can do it externally if you want to, but uh, for me, I think I sell Jesus short sometimes in my mind of what he can actually accomplish of what he could really do. How often do I really expect that he's capable of miracles? How often does that even cross my mind? I think we can get into a rut in any relationship, in any experience where we think we know how this goes and we know where it ends. Mary and Joseph maybe had started to experience that and then they're struck by who he really is and what he's really capable. That this Jesus, this Lord, this Savior, this wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, is capable of immeasurably more than they could have ever imagined. And that's true for me, too. And it's true for you, too. And so during this Christmas season, as I said, we're going to continue with this theme of exploring responses to the Savior, to the child that was born throughout the Epiphany season as well. But it's my prayer. It's my prayer for myself. It's my prayer for each of you. It's my prayer for all those of us who have called on Christ's name as in faith, that our God will continue to amaze us and that our Jesus will continue to astonish us. Because indeed, he is capable of immeasurably more than we've ever asked or imagined. And no matter how much you know, God can still amaze you. And no matter how much time you've spent with Jesus, he can still astonish you. And may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds firmly in faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.